Okay, so now we're gonna talk about exercise in pregnancy. One of the top questions I get is about what is safe for a pregnant woman to do as far as exercise goes in pregnancy. And the most important thing you can do is talk with your provider. Let them know what you were doing before pregnancy and then what you would like to continue during your pregnancy and they can direct you specifically on what's best for your pregnancy and your baby. Everybody's body is different, everybody's pregnancy is a different and so I just have to reiterate that it's important to work with your provider on this. We've partnered with my friend from Good for This Wool. She's certified in pre and postnatal fitness and so she has a wealth of information on this topic. You'll see some videos of her uh, exercises that are safe for a pregnant woman. We'll also provide a link to her website so if you want to learn more about her pregnancy workout guides, you can go ahead and do that. As far as exercise in pregnancy goes, usually in a healthy pregnancy, you can continue to do what you did before pregnancy throughout your pregnancy with modifications as you go. You wanna be listening to your body if you're feeling cramps or dizziness. You wanna take a step back, take a break, get a drink of water, and you can continue the exercise if that discomfort goes away. If it doesn't, you need to modify. The most important thing to remember in the first trimester of pregnancy is not to overheat. So you wanna make sure you're drinking water before, during, and after exercise. Of course, avoid exercises like hot yoga where you're already in a hot room, and then consider being by a fan or making sure there's good circulation wherever you're working out. I personally am a I'm a Zumba goer and I would just hoard all the fans in my corner of the room and um, people understood that I was pregnant and they were okay with that. Probably the top three exercises that are approved for any pregnant woman are walking, swimming, and spinning. They're all fairly low impact and really safe. One thing I like to do is, I'm pregnant if you didn't know, um, is I like to go to the gym and put that treadmill on an incline and then I turn on a Netflix show and I just walk for the 40 minutes or however long it takes to finish my show. Um, swimming of course is great because it's low impact and then spinning, you're on a stationary bike rather than a road bike so you don't have the risk of falling in pregnancy our growing abdomen shifts our center of gravity and so we're at risk for falling and so that's one of the modifications we have to make. We don't wanna risk falling, that's dangerous for the baby because it could lead to something like placental abruption. So we have to be aware of our coordination during pregnancy. According to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, talking about them again, Recent research has actually proven the benefits of exercise for pregnant women, and exercise is considered an important part of a healthy lifestyle. We have a whole blog post on itsthebabylady.com that goes through all of the benefits of exercise in pregnancy, but exercise increases energy levels, helps you sleep better, and it's healthy for baby and mom. Healthy pregnant women are encouraged to exercise at least 30 minutes, most if not all days of the week. Make sure you hydrate before, during, and after exercise to avoid dizziness and overheating. If at any point while you're exercising you do feel dizzy or too hot, stop what you're doing, give your body a break, take a drink. Just make sure you're listening to your body and those signals. After 20 weeks, do not lay flat on your back. It decreases blood and oxygen flow to the baby. Okay, and Kegel exercises. Another favorite topic, Kegel exercises strengthen the pelvic floor muscles, which support the bladder, uterus, vagina, and part of the rectum. So obviously these are really important to do during pregnancy. Benefits of strong pelvic floor muscles include prevention of urinary dribbling when coughing or laughing. Totally a problem I think all moms can <laughs> relate to. Prevention of sagging uterus, needing surgical repair, shortened second stage of labor, which is the pushing stage. Now that's a benefit I'd like to cash in on. To strengthen these muscles, contract the pelvic floor muscles as if you're trying to stop the flow of urine. Do these exercises in groups of 10 about 10 times per day. You can do it while you're driving. The best part is nobody's going to know that you're doing it. Second to last there, we see that we should reduce levels in the third trimester. This is because exercise becomes more difficult as your belly expands. So again, going back to listening to your body, and your joints are more susceptible to strain and vigorous exercise can strain the abdomen and back muscles and that has to do with the progesterone and the relaxin that your body starts to create to get ready for birth. 
So things to avoid, we kind of already talked a little bit about this with exercise, but avoid jerky, bouncy, high impact movements or quick direction changes, avoid deep knee bends, full sit-ups, double leg lifts, avoid anything that has you laying flat on your back, avoid motionless standing because your circulation could decrease and cut down flow to the baby. So that could be like yoga that's not prenatal yoga. Avoid moving quickly from a lying to a standing position. Avoid strenuous stretching, which can injure the tissue that connects your joints. Avoid high-intensity workouts that raise your temperature for long periods of time. And never ex exercise when you are exhausted or when you're sick. So like I mentioned at the beginning, if you want to read more about information on exercise in pregnancy, head on over to itsthebabylady.com and the post is called, Should I Exercise During Pregnancy? Okay, warning signs during pregnancy. These symptoms are all things that if you experience, you're going to want to seek medical attention immediately. Persistent or severe headaches can be a sign of pregnancy-induced hypertension. Hypertensive disorders are the most common medical complication reported during pregnancy, which can lead to preeclampsia, which means high blood pressure and protein in the urine, and eclampsia, which could result in seizures. So it's something that you're definitely going to want to take seriously. Excessive swelling is another symptom of preeclampsia. Swollen feet at the end of the day is totally normal during the third trimester. However, swelling in the morning and swelling that does not subside when putting feet up can be a sign of worsening preeclampsia. Sudden rapid weight gain is another sign of preeclampsia. Water retention is common with hypertensive disorders and the weight gain of two pounds or more in a 24-hour period should be reported to your healthcare provider. Obviously, fever is something that you'd want to call your provider about because it is a sign of infection. Pain or burning upon urination could signal a bladder infection or a urinary tract infection, which, if left untreated, could lead to preterm labor. Severe stomach pain accompanied with bright red blood from the vagina requires immediate attention. Decreased fetal movement or a change in the usual pattern of baby's movements needs prompt attention. So like I mentioned earlier, first you're going to want to drink a glass of juice and eat something like a graham cracker. Lay down on your left side and place your hands on either side of your stomach. And you should fill a minimum of 10 movements within two hours. And again, that's the guidelines recommended by the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Preterm labor is any labor that begins before 37 weeks. Common symptoms of preterm labor are regular uterine contractions, which means four or more in one hour, a low dull backache, menstrual-like cramps, unusual pressure in your pelvis, water or large amounts of mucus leaking from the vagina, red or brown vaginal discharge. Oftentimes, dehydration can cause preterm labor contractions, so drink four eight-ounce glasses of water, empty your bladder, and lie down for one hour. If contractions persist, seek medical attention immediately. So our last topic is what to bring to the hospital. And we also have a really great blog post on this topic that gives you like the full rundown of everything, why you need it. And I also have links to all this stuff. They're all Amazon links because I know that especially if we're in our third trimester of pregnancy, the last thing we wanna do is leave the house. And so that free two day shipping if you have Amazon Prime is totally worth it in this instance. But let's just go through quickly what to bring to the hospital. So you're gonna want a robe and I would go with a robe that's a darker color. This is because with birth, as you can imagine, there's a lot of blood and fluids. And so if you wanna be able to wear it after or hide, you know, more of those stains, go with a darker color. You're also gonna want something that's open in the front so that you can nurse easily. A nursing bra, again, this is if you're breastfeeding, so it's easier. Most hospitals provide a nursing gown that just has slits right in the front, super sexy. So you're gonna want a nursing bra or something to throw on if you have visitors in the hospital. I don't know, maybe you don't care, but you may want that. <laughs> definitely bring some slippers or flip-flops. I cringe whenever I see people walking the halls in bare feet at the hospital. 
I know it seems like common sense, but sometimes they treat it like a hotel or you just, you're just not all the way there. You're, so many things are going on that the last thing you're going to think about is putting on shoes. But as you can imagine, the hospital floors are just covered in germs. So bring something, some slippers to walk in and flip flops for the shower. You're going to want to bring toiletries. So whatever you personally feel like you'll want, if you want your own shampoo and conditioner, bring that. The hospital does provide it, but if you want your own stuff, bring it. You're going to maybe want deodorant, makeup, things to help you feel a little bit better after delivery. For sure, bring a camera, an iPhone or your camera phone obviously works. If you have a separate camera, bring that. You're going to want to document this special moment. Clothes for mom and baby to go home. In my newborn class, I talk about everything you're going to want to bring for baby. So check out our newborn class for that. And um, make sure clothes for mom, you're not going to fit into your pre-pregnancy clothes right away. So bring something with a drawstring or just bring comfortable stretchy leggings and a big t-shirt, flowy t-shirt that you can go home in comfortably. You'll want to make sure your support person packs a bag for themselves. They'll need a change of clothes and whatever toiletries and snacks that they might want. Bring some music or possibly a movie or a book. There's a lot of waiting time in the hospital and even the next day. I know I'm a total nerd, but I love Harry Potter. And so when we didn't have visitors around, we had Harry Potter playing in the background. And that was nice for me. Um, Bring some lip balm. The hospital air is just so dry and so your lips will get really chapped. Most hospitals provide lanolin, however it does get charged through the pharmacy and so you may want to bring your own to avoid that charge and you can use that lanolin on your lips. Sounds weird but it works, it moisturizes the lips, so that's something to think about. And then a journal. You can Write down your experience, maybe in your notes on your phone, or bring a journal to physically write it down while things are fresh and you have a minute. Okay, so we just talked about what to bring to the hospital, and now I wanted to give you guys an idea of what it's like once you check in. Most of the time, once you check in at the hospital, unless your doctor has sent you or you're going to be induced, you'll be sent to a room that's referred to as triage. Now, what this means is you're not technically admitted to the hospital yet, but you're kind of in a trial. So your nurse and your provider are gonna be watching to see if you really are in labor and if they're gonna be admitting you that day. Usually you'll have a cervical check, Um, Unless you've been checked recently and uh, your provider knows where you're at, your nurse will usually check and see where your cervix is at. And then depending on um, how far along you are in your pregnancy, if it's a high-risk pregnancy or not, all sorts of different factors, what number baby it is, they'll decide the best course of action for you. They may want to hook you up to a monitor and monitor those contractions for a couple of hours, or they may ask you to walk the halls for two hours and then come back to be checked again. And if you've made progress, you'll be admitted. Unless, of course, your water has broken or you have signs that your water is broken, they'll do something called an amniosure. And basically what this test does is it tests to see if that fluid that is leaking is amniotic fluid or not. And if it is amniotic fluid, then you'll automatically be admitted because your water has broken or started to leak. And so we want to get baby out before the risk of infection becomes too high. You may be allowed to just labor on your own, at your own pace, at your own time, or depending on all the different factors that are going on in your pregnancy, your provider may recommend that your labor be augmented. So Pitocin could be introduced to further those contractions along. And there's some other things that your nurse and provider can do to help that labor continue to progress. I do want to point out that you can make the hospital stay as comfortable as you need it. It's your labor, it's your birth, and so bring things to the hospital that make you comfortable. You can request to have the lights dimmed if that's more calming to you and feels comfortable to you. Some people choose to bring candles. You can't bring candles with a flame, of course that's a hazard, but you could bring like an LED candle. Have a couple of those around the room if that's calming to you and helps you get through that labor. You could also bring a favorite blanket or pillow to have if those are, you know, some comforting things for you. I do recommend though is have your support person move that pillow and blanket when it's time to actually have that baby because with birth, there's blood and fluids that will inevitably get who knows where and you don't want to ruin your favorite blanket or pillow so keep that in mind when you're picking those things to bring to the hospital you can bring a diffuser with your favorite essential oils you can bring in music so have those in mind those are things that I didn't include that are must-haves in your hospital bag but they may be must-haves for you so kind of think about that what you want your labor experience to be like and have that in mind for the day you deliver your baby 
So that concludes our week one. I hope you enjoyed it and we're going to move on to week two. Like I said, the teacher is going to be Julie Aiken and I think you guys are going to really enjoy her style of teaching and what she has and her experiences to bring to our class.